Open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 16. I wanted to look at the entirety of the story of the demon-possessed girl here, but it just, the way the, the scriptures to me laid out, um, I'm only going to look at three verses, verses 16, 17, and 18 in Acts chapter 16 tonight. Um, and we'll continue that story and tag it likely along with the imprisonment of Paul and Silas and the conversion of that Philippian jailer in um, the next Wednesday night that we're together. Acts chapter 16, tonight we're looking at verses 16 through 18 in a sermon entitled, Expecting the Unexpected Gospel Encounter. You know, I actually had an unexpected encounter, um, I guess that was yesterday, uh, at Walmart. Maybe it was Monday night. It's all running together. Uh, I was at Walmart, and we were doing our weekly shopping trip, and it was on on 98, so you know it's a place you don't ever want to go because you can hardly get into the parking lot and you definitely can't get out. And so we're hurried around the store and we we look and we saw somebody that we thought we knew, and then they met eyes with us, and you could see the same thing happening. And it's one of those things that is really good about Adrian. You know, uh, when when you meet somebody like Adrian, there's just so many things about her, especially her sweet, sweet personality, as well as her height, and uh, she's Asian. Uh, you know, that, and then me, I, as hairy as I am, you know, that, we just go together. Like, you, we're unmistakable, I guess. And I guess that's a double-edged sword, because when people see us, we might not know who they are. Sometimes it's been a while. And it was actually the lead singer of Crossbridge, who's come to our church a few times. And we, we hadn't seen each other in probably two years at this point. And it was just this unexpected encounter at Walmart and we caught up and we were those people. Thankfully, we were in the meat section, so there's a lot more room to have a reunion in the middle of Walmart. But it was unexpected, but it, it was it was a good time. And we we left really encouraging. Uh, he was encouraging us of our ongoing ministry. I was encouraging him by all the things I've seen on Facebook. And so it was a good encounter. And those unexpected encounters we've all had, whether it be with an old friend, whether it be with... Uh, someone who we might not want to encounter. Um, and I think most notably, and for us specifically, as we look at this story and think as, as church folk at church, sometimes I think most notably, we have gospel encounters or even, even worse, missed gospel encounters. And likely those missed encounters, those missed opportunities to share the love of Jesus and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ come because we're not expecting them, or because what is said to us in response was completely unexpected. What do I say to that? And so in this tonight, I want to talk about how we can expect the unexpected when we encounter those people whom we can share the gospel with. Let's look at our story tonight from Acts chapter 16. We'll read the three verses and then go back through them. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, these men are bond servants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed. And turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. I don't know about you, but I am plagued with a curse. Whenever I'm going to, to speak in any situation, whenever I'm going to have a tough conversation, whenever I'm going, maybe it's sometimes even a conversation that isn't so much uh, tough as it's just one that I've been preparing myself for, I play out 3,000 scenarios in my brain, all of the ways it could go wrong, all of the ways it could go great, all of the ones in between, and I just start preparing all of those things. And it, it's a curse, but it's a blessing at the same time because when I get ready to speak, then I already know which situation I want, and my, my words are already planned out to some degree or another. I'm a planner in that way. I don't think there's many of us who, when we get ready for that tough conversation, or maybe especially in a public speaking type of situation, are ready to present something, don't think out what we're going to say. Should we not do the same for the gospel? The most important, the most challenging, the most uncomfortable, the most eternal conversation 
Are we prepared? Do we know what we would say? If we were to walk out these back doors and there was some lost person who is on the doorstep and they come up to you and they say, I want to know Jesus Christ. Would you be able to share the gospel with them? Would you know what to say? Would you expect in that unexpected situation and anticipate the words that you would say? Paul shows us he does. The Christian ought to do these things. The Christian ought to be ready to give the Word of God to prepare and share the gospel of Christ. And here in verse 16, we have an unexpected meeting. We have an un- this is not, Paul did not go out searching for a demon-possessed girl who was going to annoy, annoy him for days in order that he might share the gospel of Jesus Christ with her. He was looking for people to share the, the gospel with, but this was not the situation he anticipated. How do I know? Verse 16. It happened. First of all, the, the, the way it even, it's even listed here is this, this verbal form that it just, it's happenstance. It came about. And so it was. It just rolls from one narrative to the next. This is a divine meeting, not necessarily sought out by Paul himself. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, notice here, and this is all I'll say about this, the we and the us throughout all of this. Here is another instance of the we's of Acts which is indicating that Luke has now arrived and is part of the narrative. I want to point that out as often as we see it because he arrived in the scene when we got to Philippi. And so here he is yet again. And so it happened as we were going, and here is the intention of the travel to the place of prayer. You know, certainly I I say that Paul was anticipating a gospel conversation because Paul's an apostle. He's literally on mission in Philippi at this point. But the desire and the intention of what was going on in his day-to-day life when this event happens is they were going to the place of prayer. They were headed to the church house. They were going to worship. In what scenario do you travel to church and you expect on the way to meet a demon-possessed person? You know, th- that's, that's not normal. That's not what you anticipate. That's not what you expect. Here, Paul is met with an unexpected encounter as he's going to worship. And Paul and Silas could have tunnel vision. They could say, okay, the, the, well, let's put them in Brooklyn. They, they stopped by the Keith, so they stopped by the Circle K on the way to church, and there's somebody kind of crazy outside. There's somebody out there who, who they don't look like they're headed to church this morning and they don't look like they know Jesus real well this morning. Maybe they're outside and they're cussing up a storm in Brooklyn, Mississippi. We've, okay, we, we explain the reality at this point. And Paul and Silas could have tunnel vision. They could say, I need to go in there and I need to get my cup of coffee and I need to get back out to the car because I got to get to worship. They could have tunnel vision that what they're doing right now is is taking importance. And when the day comes that I'm ready to share the gospel, then I'll go look for these people. But right now, I got got this task that I've got to take care of. Let's let's take it to our reality. When we're at work, we're we're, we're about work. We're about business. The, The other things of our life, we departmentalize that we can't touch those right now. When we're taking the kids or the grandchildren to school, when we're we're doing all of the things that are of our day-to-day life, we often have tunnel vision. Paul and Silas don't hear. It happened as they were going to the place of prayer that they meet her and they interact with her. And more than this, they share the gospel and transform her life in all of this. Let us pray that when the moment comes that ministry is able to naturally occur, we can extort it and use it for the gospel. We can take advantage of the opportunity that God places in the palm of our hand, right in our lap, and follow through with what God's doing. You know, church has become, and the mission of the church has become such a structured thing that we think people can only get saved in the church. We think that people can only get saved outside of the church if the person who who we send out on mission happens to go up to them. Like it's so structured that we have to really think about it and consider it. And when are we going to share the gospel on a scheduled visitation day as the church? Like it's, it's all scheduled. But that's not what God's about. God certainly 
He, 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 will, he will happen to, to work into our schedule. On, on those days, he will send those to us if we pray for them and expect them. But you know what he's about every single day? He's about naturally giving us these things. The best gospel conversation you're going to have is the one that just naturally happens. The one that they begin to speak and you can hear their lostness. You can hear their needs. You can hear the, the opportunities arising where I've got a Bible verse for that. Jesus could help with that. And you authentically, naturally share the gospel. You authentically and naturally connect with that person. And it so happens that they come to church with you the next Sunday or that they follow up with you and, the, and you get to share life with them a little bit more and in doing so, lead them to Christ. These are the authentic moments that we don't schedule for and therefore. We don't do them. Paul and Silas didn't schedule this out, but that doesn't stop them from sharing the gospel. And more than this, when they meet her, the first thing I think that we need to be able to do in these unexpected encounters is to analyze. There's a lot of different people out there in the world with a lot of different needs. And the gospel touches every single one of them. Jesus is able to engage and change their life in every single one of those situations. But the way that we share Jesus might be slightly different. The gospel stays the same, but the approach might change. Here, they analyze the situation in verse 16. It happened that we were going to the place of prayer. It happened in the unexpected moment. And they meet someone they don't expect to see at the place of prayer. Verse 16 tells us, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us. Immediately, they recognize this. They recognize her condition as one who is of a lower social status, as both a woman and a slave, as someone who is impoverished, as someone who is being extorted for money, and this spirit of divination that's in her, they they see and understand her religious background that they can then speak to her. When we speak to people, we need to be able to meet the things that they would charge against us. The questions that they might have, we need to be able to see that we, 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 we have an answer in Christ and here's how we can answer it. This is what we see in Anthony's favorite verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. If you'll flip in your Bibles with me, back towards Revelation, we have the general epistles. And so if you see... One of those Pauline letters like Galatians, you're not far enough. But if you hit Revelation or John, you're a little too far. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and this is Anthony's favorite verse. It might not be his favorite verse, but it's going to be Anthony's favorite verse tonight because of his Sunday school class where he talks about apologetics and defending the faith. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter, in uh, writing to the church, has this to say, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That is, make Jesus holy. Take him serious. Establish him on the throne of your heart. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Here's, here's the, the charge. If Jesus is going to be the Lord of your life, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and with reverence. Be ready that people are going to come and ask, why are you a Christian? Why do you believe that? Why do you believe that fairy tale? Why do you live like this? Why won't you do such and such? Why do you go to church every Sunday? Why, why, why? Maybe even hate-fueled. Not so much a question as much as a charge against you, an accusation. That's why he says gentleness and reverence there at the end. But he says, be ready. If Jesus is going to be the Lord of your heart, if you're going to sanctify him as Lord of your life, if you're going to make Jesus holy in your life, be ready when the questions come. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to have an, an answer to everything in order that we cannot ever say, I don't know. Those are some powerful words. We should use them often. We don't know. Not everything. 
Only the omniscient, all-knowing God knows all things. And there's going to be a point, folks, where people are going to ask of us, and we're not going to be able to give them the question. But we can't say, I don't know, but I want to find out with you. And that'll go a lot further than you'll think. This also doesn't mean that I need to know everything about every religion under the sun. Because one day I might meet a, a Sikh. I don't even know how to spell that one. It's not how you think. You know, I don't even know what those folks believe. Like, aren't those just adjacent to Hindus? I I, maybe you didn't even know that. Don't, aren't those the people that wear turbans? I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know nothing about them, honestly. But if I'm at a Sikh, would I, share, would I be able to share the gospel with them? Yes, I would. You know why? Because I know the gospel. And I know the gospel impacts every single person despite their religious background. You don't have to know everything about everything, but you do need to know the gospel and be ready to make a defense for the gospel. It does mean, however, we do need to be aware of the world around us. We can't be sheltered as Christians that we don't even understand what's going on in the world around us, that there's no possible way we would even interact with the people around us. And if we did, that we would have no idea what they're talking about in order that we could connect with them. We can't be sheltered to reach the world. It means we have to be able to dialogue to some degree with the lost, both about the gospel and an understanding of how to reach them in the culture that they're in. But I think what tends to happen when we begin to sympathize with the lost and understand the perspective that they come from, because I, I don't think I'm in a room of people who are so s stuffy that they, can't, they don't know anything about the world that's going on out there. You're, you're, you're not so sheltered that if you were to leave these room, this room right now and you were to meet somebody who is of the world in Brooklyn, Mississippi, that you wouldn't understand what they're talking about when they're talking about the dope that's on the streets or when they're, when they're, when they're using foul language or, or when, they're using, uh, when, they're, when they're just the typical person that's outside of these walls. You would know how to interact with them. But the danger in being at, at any degree knowledgeable of the world is that we become steeped of the world. We begin to sympathize with the loss to such, a, to such a degree that we then say, well, he can't come to church. He's got to make a living. He's got to go to work. Well, you know, he can't have church at home. Well, you know, what's the Bible really say about X, Y, and Z sin that is in his life? Who am I to judge him? We begin to sympathize. We begin to, to find excuses. We begin to look at it like the girl here. Verse 16 not only tells us that they happen upon her unexpectedly, that she's an unexpected person in an unexpected place, but there's an excuse readily available. Why shouldn't they engage with the slave girl? Verse 16 tells us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Here's a reason not to mess with a slave girl, not to share Jesus with a slave girl. There's going to be backlash. There's backlash. It comes in, in verse 19. We'll look at it next week. But, but more than this, it's, it's not only rocking the boat. It's, well, maybe, maybe this is a, a demon we can just leave alone because it, it's, it's a profit to those who are, who are dealing with it. This is how we interact with the world, folks, is we look at out there and we say, well, maybe I don't need to say anything to this situation. But if they were just a degree deeper into their sin, if, if, it, was, if it was impacting it just a little bit more, then I might speak. But until that day comes, I'm not ready to speak it and say anything. Well, if it was harming their children, I would, I would have to share the gospel with them. But because it seems like everything's fine, I'm not going to say anything. It's not, not that important. There's some profit to their sin right now. But when the day comes that it, it, it outweighs it, maybe then I would speak. Not for Paul and Silas. They don't care of the ways that we might dress up sin and say it's acceptable. It's a profit. It's the business venture. No, they're still going to engage. And for us, <laughs> I said it Sunday, I'll say it again. Here we are in the Christmas season. You have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to share Christ in an unexpected place to unexpecting people. And it might come with a barrier. It might come with some uncomfortable feelings. But guess what? The gospel doesn't care about uncomfortable. 
The gospel naturally calls us to uncomfortable. Share the gospel, not just now, but always be ready to witness when that time comes and let nothing deter us from standing ready to deliver God's word. But as we share the gospel with the world around us, something else unexpected might happen, especially for those of us who maybe have never shared the gospel before. We might not really expect it. We might think, I'm a Christian. I know more than the lost world out there around me. And so when I go to share the gospel with them, it'll, it'll be very clear. They'll either say, yes, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, or they'll say, no, I'm not really that interested. It's not that black and white, though, folks. When I go outside of these doors and I share the gospel with those around us, and I ask people, here's the typical question that, that you hear. This is what I think for many, many years they said, this is the phrase that you should say. It's one of these. If you were to die today, do you know where you would be? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You know, those sound like really good ways to, to start, start off. They can be. But let me tell you what you're going to hear. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. Can you tell me the day that you were saved? Yes, I can. There's people who, when you look at them on the streets of Brooklyn, every red flag comes up that they are not saved, or at least they're not walking with Jesus right now as they ought to, not in any type of way. But they will answer every question you've got right. If you were to die today, do you know where you would go? I'd go to heaven. Why? Because I'm a good person. If you were to die today, do you know where you would go? Yes, I'd go to heaven because I went to church with my grandma when I was little. I mean, you can't make it up. And sometimes they're so serious that they'll, they'll say more than that statement that you can easily counter. And they'll go on and on and on and on and on about how great Jesus is. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. I mean, they'll just keep on going. It's the Sunday school answer mentality. Growing up in my Sunday school class at Oak Grove Baptist Church, I knew how to get that Sunday school teacher off my back. If she asked any question, there was only a handful of answers. Go to church, read your Bible, Jesus, the cross. I mean, any, any question that's vague enough to be in a Sunday school, in Sunday school literature, you can almost answer it with those and get your Sunday school teacher off your back. Unless, unless they're tired of it, unless they really want serious discussion, and then they'll say, no, let's get a little deeper than that. And that's the world around us, y'all. They're surface level Christians. They know just enough about Christian culture to be able to doggy paddle when you ask them about Jesus. They know the answer to the question, do you know Jesus? Yes, I do. Where do you want to go when you die? Heaven. They know all the answers on a surface level. But if you'll go just below the surface, what does it mean to have Jesus as the Lord of your life? Why do you believe that you're going to go to heaven when you die? Can you tell me how you got saved? What is that process like? Let me tell you how I know, and without a shadow of a doubt. Those deeper probing questions share that there's a little bit more under the surface. What happens in verse 17 with Paul and Silas is... She says something surprising. The girl here who is demon-possessed, slave girl, who's being used for profit, who's unexpected in every way, gives an unexpected answer in verse 17. She says this, Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, she is following the missionaries around town. She is following the gospel proclaimers around town. And this is what she proclaims. These men are bond servants of the Most High God. She's right. <laughs> Absolutely. They are. Paul would say it himself. He is a servant. He, he goes in Galatians and he says, hey, I am a Jew of Jews. I have all the credentials, but before God, I am but a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul would agree. He's a bond servant of the Most High. And more than this, she continues saying in verse 17, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Is there anything untrue about what the girl says? It's all true. She's saying this 
as they were walking around. And it is, isn't it surprising that it's coming from her mouth and not Paul's? Like, this is free advertisement. This sounds good. It sounds like she's got a good spirit, not a bad one. We might expect something else, but she's walking around proclaiming the gospel. That's what she's honestly doing. How do we make sense of this? Because it's obvious, the slave girl who's demon-possessed, it's an unclean spirit who has possession of her, can't be saved. It's the, we, we get in verse 18 that he talks to the spirit. It's the spirit who's saying these things. The unclean spirit is saying these things. The unclean spirit is not saved. James chapter 2 tells us, so we don't have to flip there, but you can, you can read it for homework because it's a great chapter to read every time you read it. James chapter 2 tells us, even the demons believe and fear, tremble, shudder at the name of Jesus. You can know some stuff about Jesus. You can even believe he is who he says he is. The demons do. Here, the unclean spirit recognizes Paul and Silas and Luke as who they say they are. But that doesn't mean that they, they believe in an authentic, heartfelt way. And I think this is what we see in the world around us a lot of times. You have to be careful. This is 1 John chapter 4. We keep going back to it and test the spirits in all things. Because there's some people out there who would say they're ministers of the gospel, that they're preaching Jesus Christ. Joel Osteen is one of them, a real feel-good preacher who says that, that he's all about Jesus, and the reality is, folks, that he's a false teacher. There's many false teachers like him from, for, for varying degrees who proclaim a gospel of prosperity rather than a gospel of hope in, hope in Jesus, who even though there might be trials in this life, there's greater prosperity not in this life that Jesus is going to give you, but in an eternal life because it's, it's there outside of this world that we would have riches and treasures, not here where moth and rust might destroy. But did you know even a broke clock can be right tw twice a day? Ain't that how you say it? What's the idea? The idea is even if it's wrong 99% of the time, guess what? Sometimes it's right. There's a shred of truth even in the false teacher. Let's take it a little deeper. I believe, I know, I'm about to prove it in the Bible, that even the heretic, even the lost, even the person who hates God and would say to your face as the preacher, if you were to go to them and proclaim the gospel to them, that they would curse God before you, even they are right sometimes. Even they know the truth sometimes. Let's wager on it. Let's go to Romans chapter 1, because that's where we find it. In Romans chapter 1, it tells us Everybody knows the truth. Everybody knows the truth to a saving degree. Sometimes they even express it. But most of the time, 99% of the time, the lost, the heretics, and those who would curse God, they don't proclaim the truth. They suppress the truth. They hold it in. Romans chapter 1. I want to start reading in verse 18. This is the beginning of Paul's argument as he proclaims the gospel to the Gentiles of how they are grafted in under the same as the Jews, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Everybody's right sometimes because they know the whole truth deep down if they were willing to admit it. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Let me sum up verse 18 for you. God's really mad. He's going to send some people to hell. That's the wrath of God. God is so mad that he would send some people to hell, and what would make him do it? Paul does not start out with the laundry list. Look with me at Romans chapter 1, the very end. He starts in verse 29. He goes, all the, he tells them all, murderers and strife and this and that. And blah, 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 blah. He doesn't attack their sin that you can see on the, out, on the outside first. He saves that for the end. He starts with those who suppress the truth. That's what sends a person to hell, is that they know the truth about God but they're unwilling to admit it. They're unwilling to believe. They're unwilling to make him the Lord of their life. 
not the sin. The sin comes out of the suppression of truth. So God's really angry. He's going to send some people to hell. Why? Because they're unrighteous men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. How do we know that they do that? Verse 19, Romans 1, 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. Did you know that we're created? Special of all creatures in the image of God. We are created in His very image. We are image bearers. Our whole purpose of life is to give God glory. We were created for this. It's on every part of who I am. Even if I try to suppress it, it's within them, bearing witness against them that there is a God, and they suppress it. And more so, verse 19 continues, for God made it evident to them. Not only are they bearing the glory of God, they know they are. Verse 20 tells us how. For since the creation of the world from the very beginning, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Not only are they bearing the glory of God, they know it because when they look at themselves and they look at all of creation, they can tell something about who God is. Not that there might be a God, not that it's probable that there's a God. They can tell his even visible attributes. They can see with those things which are invisible about God. What do you mean, Brother Taylor? Look around. What did God say of creation? It was good. This world was built for you and me. There's a reason we take such great pride, men, in going out in nature and hunting and fishing and and, and, and gardening and planting and toiling with our hands. There's a reason, ladies, of all of the things that you guys like to do. And I'm not going to talk about the things y'all like to do because I don't don't know what y'all like to do. Uh, But in all those things, right, there's joy in them. Why? Because God created this world for us. We can see it. We can see his goodness in the way that he's created things. We can see His justice when we get really angry when somebody is treated badly. And this is something that even the world can see, right? Even the world has things that bring them great joy in this life. Who created them? Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights who is above. Even the lost get really upset and angry about things. I mean, you don't have to look very far to the left and you see lots and lots of protests. Why are they protesting? For justice. Now, their understanding of justice might be might be misunderstood, but the point is, what are they striving after? Justice for this individual. They're social justice warriors. In that Their anger against all of these things that they see as unjust is not something that they made up, but when they look at the just God who shows us right and wrong written on His law, they look and they say, I need to do something about this. This cannot go. This cannot stand. It can't be. Even the lost, when they look around the world, see these things. But verse 21, here's where they went wrong. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. For even though they knew God, they didn't honor Him. They didn't give thanks. They became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Everything that follows, verse 22 through verse 31 of Romans chapter 1, is all the ways that through their suppression, through their foolishness, now they've been given over to the sins of this world. It should not surprise us when the world says something we agree with. It shouldn't surprise us when the demon-possessed girl says, these are bondservants of the Most High God. They're proclaiming the way of salvation. It should not surprise us when we go outside of these doors and we begin to share the gospel, that they're out there and they know the Sunday school answers. They know that Jesus saves. But don't let them get away with just telling you that. Don't let them get away with living a life that is bound for hell while telling you all the Sunday school answers so that you'll shut up and get away from them. That's what they want you to do. That's what Satan is whispering in their ear as they take the test that you're presenting them with as you share the gospel. Satan is there in the background. They have the little earpiece where Satan is in their ear and he's saying, this is what you say next. This will get that Christian off your back. And what do we do? But we say, well, he must be saved. He said all the answers that I was expecting. He told me that Jesus is is his Savior. He told me that he believes in Jesus. But church, 
Even the demons believe and shudder. Even that clock that's broke is right twice a day. There's a world out there who we can tell by their actions. We can tell by the fact that Jesus Christ is not being lived out as the Lord of their life, that he is not their Lord. And if he is not their Lord, then that makes them enemies of the God whom they proclaim that they serve. They need to be slapped silly and woke up because they're wrong. We can't give up. We can't just say, well, they said Jesus, therefore that means they're safe. No, let's dig deeper. Let's push harder. Let's ask the tough questions. It's not a, a test that we might ask them a theological doctrine and if they would just say, say the right words, we'll get off their back. But we need to understand then and call them to repentance. If you're living this way, if you're telling me these things, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you living this way? Why aren't you serving the Lord? Why aren't you in church? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you raising your children this way? Why, why are you okay with all of these evil things that are happening in the world? If you believe in Jesus and you say he's the Lord of your life and you say he saved you and changed you, then why is this happening? Ask the hard questions. Point them to the realities of Scripture that they can't serve two masters. They can't have Jesus and their cake too. They can't have their sin too. And this is exactly what they do to the slave girl. Though she would say all the right answers, the reality is she just wants them out of town. She just wants to continue in her business. She just wants to continue to milk this city dry with her fortune telling. And Paul here, verse 18, I love this. She continued doing this for many days. And Paul, verse 18 says, was greatly annoyed. Paul seems like such an interesting character. I can't wait to meet him one day. <laughs> Free advertising. No. Maybe. Philippi is looking at him and looking at her and saying, they're of the same spirit. Do you see how that's bad for business, bad for, bad for Christianity, that the evil spirit is being linked with Christianity? That can't stand. Maybe that would annoy him. Maybe she's really loud and she just says the same thing over and over again, and that annoyed him. I, I, you know, may, Maybe to a degree, I think, I think Paul would be that type of character as I read the New Testament, that maybe that would be the case. Maybe. It's that he's heard this answer over and over again, and he's tired of it, and he wants to dig deeper. Whatever it might be, in verse 18, he then commands her. Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Now, it is a demon possession, and I don't suggest that you do that to the world around you unless you're really sure that somebody's demon-possessed, because demons are real, and they do exist in the world around us today. But that's probably not the way that you want to share the gospel. But what is Paul effectively doing? He's naming Jesus, he's naming the gospel, and he's commanding her to change. What did Jesus say in Mark's gospel, in Luke's gospel, in John, in Matthew? What was his message? Repent for the kingdom of God is here. It's among you. Repent. That's the gospel. It's the gospel. Here's the gospel. That Jesus, who was God before time, humbled himself and came into our world, lived a life that we could not live, and died the death that we should have died. And he did all of this in order that if we would believe on him and trust in him as our Lord and Savior, he would save us today and change our identity. That we would no longer be criminals and sinners before an almighty God, but that we would be sons and daughters before an almighty God. And that this identity change would make us residents of a place called heaven. That's the gospel. But that gospel does not come only by right knowledge. It's not that type of belief. It's knowledge that transitions into mind change and life change and action change. It changes in repentance. We can't just know. We also have to repent. We also have to change our mind and change our ways in, able, in order to follow Jesus. This is the truth of the matter. Many people know the things of the Bible. They know the right answers, but they haven't changed the way that they live their life. Their life does not align with the belief that they have or that they say they have. And James tells us faith without works is dead. These two things go together. 
Here he commands the girl, in the name of Jesus, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, come out, change this life. Church, how many around us are in the same boat? They know all the answers. They would pass with a little doggy paddle the test of do you know Jesus? But at the same time, they're not living under his lordship. And I wonder, knowing that fact, how busy are we at calling them to repentance, to calling them out of their sin? I think our primary state is to allow Sunday school truths to satisfy the, answer, the questions that we would ask of the world around us. And that can't stand any longer because the world who says they're a Christian is day by day becoming more and more antichrist. And soon there's going to be a world around us who absolutely needs us to evangelize them with the gospel. And we will see it because there will be less and less truth that comes out of their mouth. They will know less and less about who Jesus is. It's a frightening thing when you teach school and you ask these children who are in the fifth grade, 10, 11 years old, something very simplistic about who God is, about something church-related, about who Jesus is, and they don't know. Let me tell you, my cafe, one of my cafeteria workers, they are big in their church, and they take their faith very seriously. And when the kids come through around Christmas time, he says, what are we celebrating on December 25th? Whose birthday is it? And they say, Santa Claus. They have no concept of the virgin birth, of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, of the reality that what we are really celebrating down beyond all of this is that God has come amongst us. And that's generationally very different from when I was a child and from when you were a child. That shows us a generational gap that they're falling further and further away from Christ. Let's make it awkward. Let's bring them to the deep conversations that Christ must be acknowledged as their Lord. And right now, he's not. Let's expect these unexpected gospel encounters. And when we do, we will see the kingdom of God built before our very eyes and the glorious, glorious task that he's given us by our own hands. This is what he's entrusted us to do. And if we'll be faithful to do it, we'll reap all the more the blessings and the joy that come with being faithful to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony and witness of Paul and Silas and those who were with them. Who in encountering those who were lost did not back down, but shared the gospel. Who when maybe some of the right answers were spoken, dove deeper to the sin issues within and called the world around them to repentance. And most of all, who commanded the gospel message and life-changing repentance to be followed after. Lord, that you would put people in our way, maybe even tonight, through the rest of this week, maybe on our way to church on Sunday, Lord, would you put somebody in our way that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them? That even maybe in our timidity that we could instead just take the baby step of inviting them to church, of telling them of the good things that you're doing in our midst and in our very lives. Lord, I pray that you would do this in order that we would see the opportunities and give us the opportunity to follow in obedience or in disobedience. Lord, be with us as we depart from here. And Lord, I ask that you would help us to make the most of this time that we have in serving you. Bring us back together on Sunday as we gather as your church and give you the worship that you're due. Lord, we thank you and we ask all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.